Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, How to Take Care of Your Mental Health When You're Unemployed. Um, losing a job comes with a heavy emotional toll. Um, experiencing things like shock and disbelief are normal, along with feeling frustrated, anxious, lost, and even hopeless. And so when you're thrown into an uncertain future like being unemployed, it's easy for taking care of your mental health to fall by the wayside, but it's honestly one of the most important times to practice self-care. So today we're going to be talking about the importance of self-compassion, how to have a positive mindset, and tools to adjust to change. Before we begin, I want to thank our financial sponsors for this webinar, the Rotary Club of Golden. Thank you so much for your commitment to mental health and to the community. Also, um, right after the webinar, we have clinicians that are going to be available to talk one-on-one -on -one with you if you would like to have some additional support or have additional questions. So if you're interested in talking individually with someone, please send us a message through the chat and we will get you connected right after this webinar. So I'm pleased to announce, uh, introduce today's speaker, Heather Trish. Heather is the Director of Culturally, Culturally Relevant and Trauma-Informed Services and is also a licensed professional counselor here at Jefferson Center. Before I hand the mic over to Heather, I do have a few housekeeping items to cover about the presentation. First, this webinar will be available on demand after the live session and we'll email that out to you along with additional resources. And we'll also have the slide deck available. I would also encourage you to visit our website at jcmh.org where you'll find more information about how to get started if you're interested in talking with a therapist, um, as well as blog posts and information about upcoming web webinars on other mental health topics. During the presentation, please keep your microphones muted and turn off your video. You'll also want to change your Zoom view to speaker mode for the best viewing experience. And then finally, like I said, if you want to talk to somebody um, right after this presentation, message us. But also, we'll be doing a short Q&A session at the end. So if you have a question for Heather, pl please feel free to also send that through the chat at the bottom of your player. Um, and last, we want to encourage you to follow us on our social networks and share the recording of this webinar and other information about Jefferson Center. Um, I think that's all I've got for housekeeping. So without further ado, Heather, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. I'm excited to, to be here today to talk to you a little bit about uh, taking care of yourself. You know, this is something I, I think is important no matter what the circumstances, but certainly amidst uh, our current world and our new normal uh, for a bit here. So I'm gonna be talking to you specifically about um, unemployment and kind of taking care of yourself through that process. So thank you for joining today. I uh, just want to go over a little bit about um, Jefferson Center. You know, Jefferson Center has uh, been in our community for over uh, 60 years. And so um, I will say that um, we have a variety of different services and um, that includes things like your traditional outpatient mental health, um, individual group supports, we have wellness programs, we have a teen drop-in program, well, we serve those folks who have insurance, private insurance, we serve those who have Medicaid and Medicare coverage uh, and no insurance at all. Uh, so just a really wide range of uh, payer types. Um, we have crisis services available, substance use uh, services. We have specialized services uh, like trauma um, supports and suicide prevention, as well as a bilingual clinic in Spanish. We serve kiddos, we serve adolescents, we serve adults, and we serve older adults. And so we just would love the opportunity to support you in whatever way uh, you need mental health wise. Um, I will be honest, I'm having a little bit of a challenge. Uh, scrolling slides, here we go, now it's working. It's in the mood to work, yay. So um, I wanna just talk a little bit about what we'll be covering today. So we will um, be focusing on unemployment and, and what that experience is like. I wanna mention a little bit about job search. You know, Part of my background is uh, mental health, but I also have done career counseling in my background. So I'll, I'll give you a couple basics. 
and just acknowledge that we have some specific vocational services and, and job search supports at Jefferson Center more specifically. Um, I want to talk about self-compassion, positive mindset, adjusting to change, and the importance of self-care because throughout this entire process, uh, no matter what you're struggling with, whether that's straight unemployment, whether those are mental health challenges or a combination of both, self-care is essential um, in, in navigating uh, this time um, a little more comfortably. So I just want to start with this first slide and, and just kind of acknowledge where we're at. You know, unemployment right now in um, the U.S. is, is a challenge. Um, I know many people who have been laid off, who have lost their jobs as a result of businesses uh, going out of business, um, having to downsize in some way, uh, things operating in a very different way than they ever have before and needing to pivot to account for that. And so there are a lot of casualties uh, amidst COVID um, on the unemployment side. And I just want to really <laughs> focus on how, how things were going so well in the, the employment sector for so long. And that has really, really changed. And for those of you tuning in specifically about the unemployment aspect, you know all too well um, what that means and what that looks like. Um, I want to also just acknowledge that, you know, that in unemployment was not necessarily anticipated, right? So in January, February, this was not necessarily something you have made, have been preparing for. And so being taken off guard or being taken by surprise, um, that can create some challenges in, in the adjustment to your life, right? There are some very real things like rent and insurance and you know supporting yourself or your your family or um, just even what you had planned to do in life or your financial obligations um, and obviously impacting mental health as well so just want to acknowledge that that was incredibly significant and the this slide uh, outlines how that unemployment uh, really changed in, in April and May. And here we are just in June and, and we continue to, to struggle in this way. So I wanna talk a little bit about anxiety. Now, uh, what is anxiety? You know, anxiety is really this kind of sense of worry, nervousness, unease, um, often about like this thing that may be coming or is probably coming and something with an uncertain outcome. And I don't know about you, but that seems to fit the, the bill for unemployment um, completely. And so it's really normal to have some anxiety about an uncertain future, uh, job-wise um, and, and perhaps in other ways as well. So that, that sense of anxiety that a lot of people are feeling right now um, is normal. Now, is it fun? Not necessarily, uh, but it is very normal to feel anxious about this uncertain future. Um, you know, we've been in a pandemic, you know, 100 years ago. None of us have, have weathered this before. So again, a very uncertain place to be. Wanted to just acknowledge some of the common reactions to anxiety or some common anxiety symptoms. Um, you know, feeling on edge, feeling irritable, feeling like you, you tire really easily, um, your muscles feeling tense, excessive worry, um, difficulty sleeping, man, that's a really common one that you may notice. Um, and then there's some physical manifestations of anxiety as well, which can be things like heart palpitations, sweating, you know, feeling short of breath, um, in a way that you're, you're really physically feeling affected by that anxiety. Um, a sense of perhaps impending doom, like no good can come of this. Feeling out of control, you know, humans don't like to feel out of control. And so that sense of, I don't know what's gonna happen um, can be really uh, distressing for people. It's normal often to avoid um, facing intense panic, maybe to a, a, a really extended, extent um, and then even trembling or shaking some other uh, uh, physical manifestations of, of anxiety so again just wanting to acknowledge that that feeling anxiety as a result of a job loss and and not knowing 
what that job search is going to be like or what your future may look like as a result is completely normal. Sometimes people even feel like that loss of a job can be traumatic. And to clarify, you know, the definition of trauma is really when there's a really stressful life event that you experience and you just feel like your sense of security was, was completely shattered, you know, and so as a result, you feel helpless and vulnerable. And, you know, in a, in a traumatic situation, often these things um, involve that threat to safety. But in terms of a job loss, you know, it can be traumatic because you're feeling overwhelmed and perhaps even alone. And some common reactions to trauma include those, um, those items listed on the screen here. You know, you've got the emotional components to reacting to trauma. You'll see some of these really overlap with uh, some of the anxiety symptoms, things like sleeplessness and irritability, uh, fatigue and exhaustion, um, easily startled. You know, some of those seem very similar, right, to anxiety. And then there are also things that are associated with trauma that aren't necessarily associated with anxiety. And those are things like feeling guilty, you know, or helpless, or having flashbacks or nightmares, things replaying in your mind over and over. And sometimes you feel like you can't really get those to stop. Um, there are cognitive affectations of trauma, including difficulty concentrating, you know, having a really difficult time making decisions or remembering things. Um, there, there's something called dissociation, and that really looks like people zoning out and just kind of not being present um, and not being able to focus and just tuning, tuning out. Um, some people experience headaches. Uh, social withdrawal or alcohol or drug use. And again, these are common reactions to trauma. And I'm not saying that if you lose a job, these things are definitely ones that you will experience. But I, what I'm trying to do is just, you know, normalize some of the reactions you may have had as a result of losing your job. And that, you know, there's probably a continuum of severity in, in what you're experiencing. I just want to acknowledge the normalcy of that. So after your job loss, um, you then have to face a job search, right? And, and some people have been through that several times, and a lot of people, you know, that's a first time they're ever going to have to search for a new job, right? And there are some, um, there are some supports at Jefferson Center that we can provide uh, through a job search. And I just want to kind of underscore that service that is available in our community. Um, and this is the short and sweet version of, of job search. You know, this is an entire field, career counseling and job search support. So I don't want to kind of minimize all that's involved. But here's a couple, um, here are a couple points that you may want to consider in your job search. Um, you know, I remember working with people who had been laid off um, working in New York City uh, prior to and after 9-11. And it was a very interesting time in terms of unemployment, unemployment and job search. And we often talked about making the job search your actual job, right? So getting up at a similar time and having that structure each day showering, getting dressed as if you're going to a job because your job search is now your job, right? Organizing yourself in a way that you are prepared to sit down and focus on that job search in a very specific way. Um, setting SMART goals, that's capitalized for a reason, that's an acronym. SMART goals are specific, measurable, attainable, realistic and timely. So setting, breaking larger things into smaller things that are very uh, attainable and doable, right? So your goal may be to get a job, but perhaps today's goal is to research uh, a certain industry or a certain company and get more information in order to put together a resume, a cover letter, and prepare for an interview. Um, you want to research your options. You know, sometimes a uh, uh, the loss of a job can be a, an incredible opportunity. You know, if you lost a job that you were not necessarily happy at um, and you 
kind of wanted to venture in another way, you can identify some of those transferable skills that would be apl applicable in a different industry or in a different area. Um, so you can research those options and see what the possibilities could be for you. Um, you want to cast a wide net, right? You don't want to hang your hat on just one specific option for a job that but if you don't get that, that's gonna be pretty devastating, right? You wanna to continue to cast a very wide net and continue to apply until you are sitting in that job and receiving a paycheck, right? That is the best um, kind of strategy for going about uh, uh, getting your next job. Um, in, in today's electronic world, you really wanna tailor your applications and identify keywords. Um, some larger companies, really um, use different software to scroll through the stack of applications that they receive. And so utilizing specific keywords that are contained in the job, uh, job uh, posting would be very important in today's world. Um, you wanna create your pitch. And what that means is how are you going to create your narrative? What is your narrative? Who are you? What do you wanna convey to this potential new employer? Um, what do you want? What is your value to the company? And making it short and sweet, right? And practicing that over and over so that that comes across in a, in a positive way that you are perceived as a, as a potential asset to that organization and how uh, they function, that they really need you going forward, right? Um, you wanna practice interviewing. I used to do this um, a lot with graduate school uh, students in the business school at NYU and New York and, and practicing interviews um, is so essential. I used to do this over and over and over for eight hours a day sometimes and um, get feedback about what that interview is like. You can practice with a family member, you can practice with a friend, uh, you can, <clears throat> excuse me, practice with a job coach or a job counselor um, because again, you know, if you haven't interviewed for a while, you might be a little bit rusty. And so practicing that process for when you do get that interview would be really important. Networking, I cannot underscore this enough. Uh, networking is essential uh, to obtain a job. Um, there are incredible <laughs> uh, pieces of research on how networking gets people jobs, right? It, it's an incredibly high percentage of folks who obtain their next role via networking. So please don't underestimate the value of making those social connections and connections to those connections and continuing to network in the field where you're trying to find a job. I wanna make sure that while you're in this job search, you really have some self-compassion. So what does that mean? You know, you may be able to have a lot of compassion for other people, but when you are self-critical, right? It's hard to look at yourself and have the grace and understanding that you do for those other people. So you want to make sure that you recognize you are not alone, right? You remember that slide I just showed about so many people going through this job search process at the same time? You are not alone. You really aren't. And so recognizing that and having that understanding um, makes it so that you are not um, really personalizing the job loss experience, right, which does initially feel very personal. You are the one that lost the job, right? But you also in this process want to be aware of all feelings and accept them and try to uh, avoid over-identifying only with the negative, right? I was fired because I didn't do this or I was a bad employee or if I adjust, right? If you focus on those things, right? It's going to be pretty difficult for you to portray yourself uh, as a positive asset to a potential organization or even difficult to maintain hope through that job search process. And so you really want to have a little bit of space and grace for yourself as you're, as you're going through this, right? And, the, and just a little bit of compassion that's incredibly important. Another thing that's important is having that positive mindset. So what does that mean? 
you know, a lot of you may have heard in the news or in literature about the importance of gratitude. And what we know from research is that gratitude has an incredibly positive impact on your, on your mental health. And so keeping a gratitude journal, you may have heard of doing this. That doesn't have to be fancy. Heck, you can put notes in your phone on a daily basis or start your day with a gratitude meditation or just even speaking to yourself in your head about some of the things that you're thankful for on a regular basis. Some people do like to start their day like that. Some people like to check in in the middle of the day. Some people like to tune in uh, to those things right before bedtime, right? So adjusting your mental health uh, via uh, the, the gratitude, right? And, and a, a perspective of, of abundance, right? Knowing there is always enough right? It might be difficult, but there is enough resource. There is enough love. There is enough kindness. There is an, enough support, right? Not being fearful of um, kind of a mentality of scarcity is not going to help you maintain that positive mindset. You do want to focus on the present, right? I'm not saying avoid the past. I'm not saying, you know, just don't think about the job loss and what that experience was like for you. There's real value in looking at that and, and feeling the feels and, and allowing yourself to be sad or have feelings of loss. But by focusing on the present and where you are now, you can tune into that, that um, thinking about opportunity right? What, what do I want? I am here now. What can I do now? That, that tends to allow people to feel more empowered, right? And be able to see the opportunity in the current situation. I will say I have had several people that I work with uh, clinically say to me, you know, COVID is the best thing that has ever happened to me in my life. And that is not at all to downplay the seriousness of the health conditions and the loss that we have experienced in our in our lives as a result of the coronavirus and this current pandemic that we are in. However, those statements are made with a, a lens of opportunity to slow down, to check in, to see what's important, what's valuable, to adjust your life in a way that maybe it's not as fast, it's not as busy, right? It's more focused on connection and health and what you really want to do in your life, right? That gives trauma and, and change can give people the opportunity to see what is possible going forward. And so all of those things can help with, with that idea of positive mindset. Um, as you move forward in your job search. Also want to acknowledge it's really difficult to adjust to change. You know, change comes out of nowhere, just like this bowling ball, right? Comes out of nowhere and, and shatters that sense of normalcy. And so adjusting to change, um, sometimes you feel like you don't have a choice. And, and all you have is the opportunity to adjust. And so, you know, Doing something that we call in the mental health field reframing, you know, seeing the world in a different way than maybe you did before, reframing that. So as humans, we tend to take the information in our lives and, and it goes through our brain, the computer, right? And we uh, interpret that data. It creates a feeling. And then we, as a result, do a behavior, right? we have the opportunity to reframe that information that's coming into our brains. We can, we can see it through a different lens. So if you can adjust and reframe that information that is coming in from our environment, it's gonna change the feeling that we experience and therefore the behaviors that uh, will be linked to that. Um, and so that reframing uh, is, is an incredibly valuable tool, a cognitive tool, a mental health tool uh, that is beneficial, I think, in most circumstances, but certainly in the situation of a, a job loss and a job search. 
uh, how else can you adjust to change? You know, there has to be a sense of acceptance. If you continue to fight the reality that you are living in, there is no possibility of accepting that, right? Um, so if you can get to the point of acceptance of this change and how that's occurring, uh, you, again, are a little more empowered to be able to be in control of your present, right? Uh, this next one, tuning into gratitude. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. You know, this, this idea of gratitude is, is just essential. Little things, right? I'm grateful for the opportunity to learn how to adjust to change. You know, I've never had to do that in my life before. And I see that probably for the next, you know, several decades that I have on this earth, that, that perhaps the adjustment, learning how to adjust to change, um, that that's going to be an opportunity for me to do this better the next time some sort of change in my life, life comes around. You know, we have to adjust to a lot of different changes throughout our lives, perhaps job search, perhaps relationship changes, location, geographic uh, changes, the changes in the way that uh, we function, right, electronically. There's always something new electronically we need to adjust to. So there's so many opportunities for us to face change in a different way going forward. If you can be grateful for that opportunity and see that that is a chance for you to learn different skills and grow, you're going to adjust to change uh, much, much better, right? You want to continue to make the effort. And you might say, well, well, that's really hard. And, and I, I validate that. That is very hard to continue to make the effort when you feel like you don't have the energy to do so. But continuing to make that effort and get up over and over again, right? You get knocked down, you get back up again, you get knocked back down, you get back up again. You know, that takes a lot of energy and I acknowledge that. Um, and when you continue to do that, you show yourself that you are resilient, you are capable of doing this, there is a possibility of a hopeful future, right? And so that is incredibly valuable um, to hold on to that possibility. Uh, it's also helpful to acknowledge the positivity of others. You know, sometimes we have people in our lives that aren't the most positive, right? And that could be family, that could be friends, um, but acknowledging the positivity of others, really getting inspired by coaches, by athletes, by friends, by neighbors, by children that are doing amazing things in this world. You know, acknowledging that there are, there are good things in this world, there are good people, and that you would like to emulate them in certain ways. Acknowledging that positivity that others can play in your life can also allow you to adjust to that change. I would be remiss as a clinician if I didn't focus on self-care. And I do feel like this is kind of a buzzword, but I use it anyway so that we can tune into what it actually is. Self-care really is the process of taking care of yourself in general. Now today we're really talking about unemployment and job search and strategies and adjusting to you know, what has happened and planning for the future. Self-care is important no matter what mental health challenge you are having or whatever life challenge you are, you are having. So right here, I'm kind of outlining the importance of physical and behavioral self-care and what that looks like. You know, it is important to have uh, regular exercise. This is kind of my saving grace, personally. Exercise is, is the place where I lose my stress and, and it sloughs off. And, and even if it's difficult to get there and do that intense exercise, I guarantee always afterwards I feel better, right? That stress has melted off of me. Um, sleep, you know, again, with anxiety and trauma, sleep can be really difficult. So ideally, you're wanting to get eight to 10 hours every night. The reality of that might be that if you're struggling with sleep, all you're doing is seeking to increase that sleep that you're getting on a regular basis. I will say in the midst of this COVID pandemic, you know, a lot of us are watching a lot more screen time, TV, you know, streaming services and, and binge watching perhaps. And I, I just want to acknowledge that that is uh, what a lot of people are doing. And some of that can be really beneficial. You tune out, you get relaxed, you get to 
you know, not think about your current circumstance for a bit of time, but what it can also do is really eat into that uh, amount of time that you're sleeping. So, you know, perhaps limit that screen time um, or exposure to certain media that might not be as helpful um, and try to increase that sleep. So if you're sleeping five hours of that, a night, you know, you might say, hey, you know, I wonder if I can get 30 more minutes, right? And, and adjust that. Um, just something that is really helpful and, and reparative and necessary for us as humans to get enough sleep so it can kind of regenerate those mood stabilizing uh, aspects uh, of, of our bodies that are so important. Um, eating healthy. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I go to the grocery store, there's a limit on the amount of flour and sugar and chocolate chips on the on the shelves. I think we're all doing a, a bit more cooking and baking these days while we're staying home and stay home orders. Um, please make sure to look at what you're eating because what you put into your body also helps stabilize uh, mood and your physical feeling, right? Um, so that's something to think about. Limit the alcohol and smoking. Um, that, that should go without saying, but you know, some people see those as coping mechanisms. And for healthy self-care, you really want to limit the um, ingestion of, of either of those items. Uh, water. You know, we live in Colorado. I feel like I don't usually meet a person who's not walking around with a water bottle. I feel like we, we do a decent job at ingesting water on a regular basis. Uh, but that is essential. We are mostly made up of water, so we, we really need that to maintain some uh, physical health. Um, there might be some things that you enjoy, like a massage, hot tub, sauna, those kind of like body interventions. Some of those are available, some of them might not be amidst a pandemic, uh, but just even thinking about stretching can be helpful. Um, and then some people find yoga really helpful. I've never been able to uh, get into it. I, I seem to, at this point in my life, really prefer the intensive cardiovascular activities. Uh, but as my body has gotten older and older, that stretching, that yoga, just the kind of mindful practice is incredibly beneficial. So if that's something that works for you, I highly recommend um, that as a regular practice and as a regular part of your day. Uh, there are also emotional and relational aspects to self-care, you know, connecting with family sometimes, sometimes not, uh, friends, um, people that you have worked with uh, in the past. Therapy is a really valuable uh, support that people find um, helpful in the midst of a job search, in the midst of a challenging time in life. And for a lot of us, just as a regular uh, piece of support, no matter what's going on in life, to have that therapeutic support on a regular basis allows us to check in and to kind of leave things at that office, right? And, and not have to hold on to things and circle around them. The value of receiving support and a different perspective um, can really be helpful. Uh, emotional and re relational self-care may inc include things like journaling. Some people are really into writing and it feels good to just, you know, pour things out onto a page. Um, some people like to reflect back on that, some people do not. Um, breathing exercises, you can do just very simple breathing exercises and people around you won't even know what you're doing, right? But really remembering the importance of breathing in through your nose and all the way down through your abdomen and, and back and not only breathing really kind of short breaths only in your chest, right? You want to do the deep breaths that really relax your body. Uh, meditation works for a lot of people and, you know, some people have an aversion to that word or that idea of a meditative practice, but meditation can be as, as basic as you know, having positive thoughts in your mind that you regularly remind yourself of, um, or it can be as advanced as, you know, different mantras or meditations that are, that are gone through. There's a lot of electronic free apps even that will talk you through meditation visualizations, um, and a lot of people have incorporated that into their regular practice. 
um, other ideas for self-care. People like movies, TV, books, music, anything that really restores you. I would encourage you to check in and and just see, you know, is this something that is an asset to me or is this draining me in some way? And try to limit those draining activities. You know, it's life. This is reality. We're going to have some activities and th things that drain us. But if you can do a little more that rejuvenate you and fill that cup back up, you're going to fare a little bit better. I will say, you know, self-care in a spiritual way, the longer I've done this work, and at this point, this is about 25 years, the longer that I do this work, I understand that if we do not look at the spiritual aspect of a human's uh, existence on this earth, we are missing a huge piece of opportunity uh, and health. And so, you know, for some people that may look like religiosity, and for some people it may look like just uh, the connection to the larger world and, and what that meaning is, right? So there's a real large span of what that spirituality might look like for some somebody. Um, it might look like prayer or meditation or specific readings. Um, it might look like talking about things that really matter to you and, and having that connection in that way. Uh, connecting to the outdoors, again, I want to acknowledge that we're in Colorado and for a lot of us, that outdoors is a, is a huge piece of our spiritual connectivity. I know that I'm a skier, I'm a hiker, and I, every time I'm in the, in the wilderness, I just kind of take a deep breath and go, oh, there I am, right? It's incredibly healing uh, for me personally, and I know a lot of Coloradans who feel similarly. Uh, some people love to sing, you know, I, I feel like Sometimes we forget that, and maybe that's because we're driving less in our cars and singing at full volume uh, with the windows up. Um, and, and singing can be, and having a little dance party in your living room anytime you want can be a huge asset. And also solitude, you know, that, that is certainly true for introverts, but solitude and being by yourself on occasion can be really, really helpful. Um, so some solitude, but definitely also remembering that it's important to connect to other humans, especially amidst things like stay-at-home orders. I wanted to take the opportunity to do a brief exercise with you, uh, just because this is an easy one that allows you to recognize the difference between tension and relaxation. And I feel like most people can do what is called progressive muscle relaxation or PMR uh, is the shorthand. And so I'm gonna talk you just through a very brief version of this. You can extend this if it's valuable to you and there's lots of PMR exercises, again, on free apps on your phone or your tablet or online or YouTube, uh, but, but you can also walk this through um, just even in your mind. So what we're gonna do right now is I want you to sit comfortably. Now you can do that relaxing in a chair, sitting up. You could do this lying down as well. And what you're gonna do is just start from the top of your head and we're gonna go all the way to the tip of our toes, but we're kinda of gonna go in order, right? So we're gonna start with the, the top of our heads and our jaws and our eyes and just all of our facial muscles and just really tense those places on your body. And you're just gonna hold those for a few moments and notice your breathing while you are tensing those things. And then you're gonna suddenly release them. And you're gonna notice the difference between the incredible tension you just experienced and now the incredible relaxation you feel in that way. And then you're going to move down. You're going to tense your neck and your shoulders, right? top of your back, really, really tense. And you're still breathing slowly and calmly, and then you relax. And again, feel the difference between that tension and the relaxation. And then you're gonna go all the way down your arms, your upper arms, all the way down to your fingers and your fists, and you're gonna ball your fists, and you're going to tense your arms and just hold them incredibly, incredibly tensely. 
And again, you're breathing while you're doing this. You are not holding your breath. And then you're releasing that very suddenly so that you can feel that difference between tense, tension and relaxation. And then you're gonna tense your chest and your stomach all the way down to your buttocks and just tense your core, your front and back, incredibly tense. And you might notice that, huh, that's, that's affecting my breathing a little bit. I'm still breathing, but I really notice how that affects my breathing. And then you're going to suddenly release. And then you're going to tense down your thighs and your quads and your calves all the way to the tippy toes. Right, and so the whole bottom half of your body is incredibly tense, very tense, as hard as you can kind of tense that part of your body. And you're just gonna hold that for another moment, and then you're gonna release. And at that moment, you're going to scan from the top of your head down to your fingertips, all the way down your core to your, to your toes, and just notice what you've just done with your body and how you have more control over the tension and relaxation as you're uh, paying attention to your present and really focusing on where you're at currently. And this is, again, a, a very short, very simple exercise that you can do on a regular basis. If you're noticing yourself a little keyed up, if you're sitting at your computer, uh, monitor and you're noticing those shoulders have come up by your ears and you're feeling really tense, right? You can do this and this really forces your body to relax in a way that you can kind of shake off some of that physical tension. I want to just share some resources with you. You know, these are just a couple websites. I don't encourage people to get too far into websites to you know, work them up about anxiety or trauma, but I just want to acknowledge there's some really valuable pieces of information at the National Institutes of Mental Health, the National Center for PTSD. If you are needing crisis support, we do have Colorado Crisis Services. There's a website listed there, but their telephone number is 1-844-493-8255. Eight two five five, and that's twenty four seven. They're available to help support you in the middle of the night, in the middle of the day, if you feel like you need mental health support. Jefferson Center for Mental Health. That's where I work, and I've dedicated my last fourteen years to, and believe in strongly. We have an incredible group of individuals who are here to support you and are passionate about mental health. And our main number is three zero three. 425-0300. And this, out, this website outlines the variety of different services that we do provide to our community. And I want to share briefly my contact information if anyone needs to follow up individually about anything that I've presented today. So I am done with my presentation. So what I'm going to do is uh, stop sharing my screen and allow our coordinator to take over and uh, see if there are any questions in the chat. And I'd be happy to answer any. Yes, Heather, um, we do have a couple of questions. So um, the first one says, um, it's been two months since I lost my job and I started off feeling pretty positive, but as it's gone on longer and I keep getting job rejections, I'm feeling worse and worse. Uh, I don't feel like I'm ever going to get a job. I just keep getting rejected. What can I do to feel hopeful again? You know, that that is such a great question because um, a lot of people feel that, right? They, they lose the job and they think, oh, okay, you know, I'm going to be able to get a job uh, pretty immediately. And when that doesn't happen, that experience of the delayed next job can get to you and it can help your mental health. You know, that's a perfect example of maybe considering doing something different. You know, it may have nothing to do with you and the reason why you're, you're not getting a job. You know, we've got high unemployment rates. There are a lot of uh, companies that have gone out of business, right? Maybe jobs aren't as available as they used to be. 
And so, you know, a couple months in when you're noticing your mental health slide a little bit, that might be the perfect opportunity to connect to someone like a career counselor or a mental health therapist who can support you and be a piece of the, the hope and support that you're gonna need to keep that positive mindset and be compassionate towards yourself, have that grateful mentality, right? It's difficult to do that on your own. So that might be a perfect opportunity to receive um, some support. Maybe that's not something you've done thus far. And so why not try that? Great, thank you, Heather. Um, that that's a really good point too of remembering that like it's not it's not personal when you're even getting, though it you feels know, personal. It yes, it definitely it definitely feels personal, but yeah. um, but that it's not. Um, also, I just want to remind everyone um, that if you are interested in speaking with um, a clinician here at Jefferson Center, um, you can still there's still time that if you want to talk to somebody right after we're done with this Q and A. Um, and speak to someone individually, um, just send us a message in the chat and we will get you connected with somebody right after this. Um, so Heather, the next question we have is, um, this person said, I feel really bad because I find myself snapping at my wife and kids when they're just trying to help. Um, so in addition to feeling bad about the job loss, now I feel bad about how I'm treating my family because I don't, I don't mean to and I know they're just trying to help me. How can I manage my irritability and be less angry? Oh man, man, I feel ya. That's what I wanna say. When I get stressed, I get a little snappy too. And um, you know, I, I, I noticed that um, my family sure doesn't like it. And so I can really, really relate to that. Um, you know, I have found personally, when I increase um, my connection to the things that work for me, I tend to get a little, less irritable personally, right? So I, I come from that, that lens of knowing that that works for me, but I also have a lot of years of working with other people knowing it works for them as well. And so what I mean by that is, you know, are you exercising? Are you eating right? Are you getting enough time alone? I feel like a lot of us are working at home or staying at home or not working at home or trying to manage school from home and be a teacher even though you're not trained to be a teacher. There are so many stressors and then you add a job loss on top of that um, and you're, you're continuing to just be around your same people that you've kind of quarantined with. I would encourage a little bit of regular time alone. Some people that I know have, have just scheduled a, a regular walk listening to a podcast or their favorite music, um, going to a park just for a little bit of time, you know, not completely getting out of the house all the time, right, and leaving the, the child care to the other partner necessarily, but just, uh, go to a park, right, take some, take some deep breaths of the outdoors, change your scenery, you know, some of this safer at home adjustment that we have done means that maybe we don't only have to stay in our neighborhoods, maybe we might be able to venture out to the other park that we haven't been to in three months, right? Change of scenery can help. Um, just anything that you feel like is really helpful and stress reducing to you, I encourage you to do that. I would also venture to guess that part of that irritability is you being hard on yourself, right? And being critical of what you are doing or what you're not doing or uh, creating some sense of distorted value of, of, of the role that you're now playing in the lives of yourself and your family, right? So if you find yourself being really critical and negative about um, your situation, that's also gonna create some irritability as well. Because irritability is just, you know, saying, I've had enough, I can't take any more, like everybody back off. And so if you listen to that, and you can be proactive about being in a better, better mental health space, then your irritability and your, your snappiness towards others tends to be reduced. So I hope those are a couple ideas that might get you thinking about what would work for you. That was great, thank you. I think we have time probably for one more question. And so this one says, 
I'm just so sad all of the time and I don't have the energy to be, you know, doing these things that you've mentioned, like, like self-care and, yeah. and even sometimes looking for a job. Um, what, what can I do? What can I do to vo motivate myself to do the things that I know I should be doing? So uh, the word in that sentence that I'm going to focus on is should, right? We can should ourselves to death. Um, that is a, a difficult position to be in. And, you know, I don't know the person that asked that question, but what I can say is that amidst that, I hear a lot of depressive symptoms. And again, completely understandable, whether that's a one-time depressive episode as a result of a really difficult time, right? or if that's a recurrent depressive symptom that kind of has come in and gone in your life at different points. But I definitely hear depressive symptoms. And sometimes, you know, that, that is a, a real heads up to connect to a mental health therapist or even obtain medication. Because when you're in that depressed space, as you describe, it's really hard to kind of pull yourself out of that place. And so, if you're finding that you, quote, should be doing other things and you really cannot find the energy or the motivation to move forward and do those things, that's a perfect opportunity for you to look at connecting to mental health supports. Because, you know, there's, there's a basic struggle, right? Oh, this is hard, but uh, I'm still able to kind of do the things that I need to do. And then it's a very different situation to say, I know what I should be doing, and I literally cannot bring myself to do them. That is the point at which you want to connect with a mental health uh, professional and sometimes even consider medication. And I just want to say about medication, that's never something that I go to as a first step. However, a lot of people can benefit from even a short-term medication intervention to get you back in the space where you are functioning and maybe that medication um, can even be pulled back at some point. So it doesn't have to be a forever thing, neither does therapy, but that's a real hint to connect so that you can get the support you need and get out of that kind of depressive space, uh, work on your depressive management pieces, get structure and stability back in your life so that you can uh, continue with your job search. Great. Thanks, Heather. And that, I think that's a great point that there's so many different options, um, you know, with medication, with therapy, and also that, um, you know, just, just because you, you have to be on medication for a little while that it can be temporary or not if it makes you feel better and that, you know, there's just so many different options to get help. So um, I think that's all the time we have. So um, I'm just going to throw it out one more time. If you, um, if anybody on this webinar wants to get help right now, um, we are here. So just message us. But um, Heather, thank you so much. Uh, thank you everybody for attending. Um, just Everybody just remember that no matter what you're facing in life, if you're feeling overwhelmed, worried, or stressed, um, Jefferson Center is here for you. We are open and accepting new clients, and accessing care is easier than ever with virtual appointments. So you can visit our website at jcmh.org or follow us on Facebook for more resources and information. And you can also reach us by calling us at 303 Four two five zero three zero zero. Again, Heather, thank you. Thanks for everybody to joining us today and have a wonderful day. Thanks.